ending of Philip K. Dick's novel, The Man in the High Castle, is going to conclude with us encountering this almost legendary character, Abinson, the author of The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, which is one of the main books that is being referenced, read, discussed within Philip K. Dick's novel, and there's another book, The Oracle or the I Ching, The Book of Changes, that also plays a massively important role. And what we see in the end is that the two of these are not as distinct as we have been led to think over the course of the work. And it's Juliana Frank who is going to figure this out and in a certain sense, go beyond what both of the Abinsons have figured out themselves. Let's try this all from the start. All right. In the very final chapter, you okay? Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> sorry. Go ahead. In the very final chapter of Philip K. Dick's alternate history novel, The Man in the High Castle, we get to meet the man in the high castle no longer living in one, along with his wife, Abinson, the author of one of the two really important books mentioned, consulted, read within this novel, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, which is itself an alternate history, which uh, presents a world in which Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan didn't win World War II, but instead it is the United States of America and uh, Britain, the British Empire, who triumph in the end. So an alternate history to an alternate history that we're reading. And the other main book that is constantly invoked, it's going to turn out to be closely related to The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, and that is the Oracle or the I Ching or the Book of changes. And the, the main person who is going to figure this out, whose eyes and thought we're going to get this through in interactions, is Juliana Frank, who constantly consults the Oracle. And so we need a little bit of stage setting before we get to her encounter with the author and his wife. So in chapter 13, she has already killed Joe, the secret agent who is uh, trying to get them to the Abinson so that he can actually kill this author. And she thinks to herself, why didn't I consult the Oracle? Too bad I didn't consult the Oracle. It would have known and warned me. Why didn't I? At any time I could have asked any place along the trip or even before we left, she began to moan involuntarily. The noise, the howling she'd never heard issue out of her before horrified her, but she could not suppress it even though she clamped her teeth together, a ghastly chanting, singing, wailing, rising up through her nose. And so she's going through something almost like a spiritual or shamanic experience with uh, her grief, her anguish, and wishing she had used this, you know, possibility of, of tapping into reality itself. So she, in fact, does uh, get out her yarrow stalks and gets out the two volumes of the Oracle and asks it, what will I do? Tell me what to do Please, and we've already talked about this elsewhere where it gives her, you know, uh, basically, uh, the oracle says even more emphatically, get up to Cheyenne and warn Abinson, however dangerous it is to me, I must bring him the truth. Now, what is the truth at this point? The SD, the Sacred Dean's Heist, are after him and they want to kill him. So she is going to um, get on her way. And then in chapter 15, 
we find that she finishes the book, his book, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. She made herself comfortable in the motel room, turning on the radio, getting coffee from the motel lunch counter. She propped herself on the neatly made bed with a new unread clean copy of The Grasshopper, which she'd bought at the hotel bookshop in Denver. At 6.15 in the evening, she finished the book. And now we get to something really critical. I wonder if Joe got to the end of it, she wondered. There's so much more in it than he understood. So, okay, not a surprise that she is getting more out of it than Joe himself is, but now she goes on further And she says, what is it Abinson wanted to say? Nothing about his make-believe world, his fictional world in which the Allies have won World War II. And then she says, am I the only one who knows? I bet I am. Nobody else really understands the grasshopper but me. They just imagine that they do. So we're not going to find out what this realization on her part is until a little bit later in chapter 15 when she shows up at the Obinsons. And, you know, she's let inside. And then there's going to be a series of important questions that are being asked and kind of answered, right? So first, she asks Abinson, Um, Hawthorne Abinson, do you uh, know the oracle? And he says, no. And she says, the book of changes? I don't, no. And then Carolyn Abinson says, don't tease her. And then Juliana says, I read your book. In fact, I finished it this evening. How did you know all that about the other world that you wrote about? And then she asks, did you use the oracle to do that? Hawthorne glanced at her. I don't want you to kid or joke. Tell me without making something witty out of it. And we should pause here for a second. So Abinson is rarely going to give, Hawthorne Abinson is rarely going to give straight answers to Juliana. In fact, it's his wife, Carolyn, who is going to supply the missing information. And there's kind of two levels of obfuscation here or misdirection, you could say. One is being witty, urbane, right? Being superficial. The other is misdirecting at a deeper level. And so this is very interesting. So um, he gazes down at the floor. Everybody else has become silent. And then he says, That's a hard question to answer. And Juliana says, no, it's not. So we've got a conflict already there. And he says, I'm sorry, I can't answer right away. You'll have to accept that. So then she changes to another line of questioning. Why did he write the book? What was going on there? And... He, again, Mr. Exit, what's that pin on your dress do? Ward off dangerous anima spirits out of the immutable world? Or does it just hold everything together? And then she says, why do you change the subject? Evading what I asked you and making a pointless remark like that, it's childish. And then Hawthorne Abinson says, everybody has technical secrets. You have yours, I have mine. And now he gives some advice about how the book is ought to, should be read, right? His intention as an author, his direction. You should read my book and accept it on face value just as I accept what I see without inquiring if it's genuine underneath there or done with wires and staves and foam rubber padding. Isn't that part of trusting in the nature of people and what you see in general? And now notice how Dick describes what's going on here. He seemed, no, uh, she thought, irritable and flustered now, no longer polite, no longer a host. And Carolyn, she noticed out of the corner of her eye, had an expression of tense exasperation. Her lips were pressed together and she'd stopped smiling entirely. Now this is going to carry on through the rest. So Juliana says, in your book, You showed there's a way out. Isn't that what you meant? Now, a way out of what? 
a way out of the world, the reality that they're in. And Abinson says, out, he echoed ironically. Juliana says then, you've done a lot for me. Now I can see there's nothing to be afraid of, nothing to want or hate or avoid here or run from or pursue which is an interesting way of talking about things. And we should pause on that for a moment. What is she actually mentioning? What is she actually referencing in this? So they're caught within a world that is essentially a dystopia, right? A world that seems to be the only reality as opposed to the fiction, the projection, the fantasy that is represented in The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. She's saying that this book is showing that there's a way out and that affects things in this world. And so he says, there's a great deal in this world worth the candle, in my opinion. And she says, I understand what's going on in your mind. And then she tells the story of, you know, the SD and and killing Joe and, uh, you know, the fact that they're going to be hunting him. Then they move on back to another key question. She says, the oracle wrote your book, didn't it? And then Hawthorne says, do you want the truth? She says, I want it and I'm entitled to it for what I've done. Isn't that so? You know it's so. And then Abinson says, the oracle was sound asleep all through the writing of the book, sound asleep in the corner of the office. His eyes showed no merriment and said his face seemed longer, more somber than ever. So before he was making, you know, witty, humorous remarks. Now he's still trying to misdirect her, trying to lead her away, but it's no longer in a happy, convivial way. And then Carolyn says, tell her she's entitled to know for what she did on your behalf. I'll tell you then, Mrs. Frank, one by one, Hoth, Hawthorne, Abinson made the choices, thousands of them. How? By means of the lines, historic periods, subject, characters, plot. It took years. Hoth even asked the Oracle what sort of success it would be. It told him that it would be a very great success, the first real one of his career. So you were right. Now notice the next thing that she says to her. You must use the Oracle quite a lot yourself to have known. That's the realization that we had back in the earlier part of chapter 15. So Juliana Frank realizes something that nobody else has so far about the book, except for the Abinsons, which is that the Oracle itself was not just used for writing the book. The Oracle was directing the writing of the book. So Hawthorne himself is going to say that, you know, they, they came to an agreement <laughs> regarding royalties. But Juliana is going to say, okay, so why would the Oracle write a book? What's the point in that? Did you ever think of asking it that? And why one about the Japanese and Germans losing the war? Why that particular story and no other one? What is there it can't tell us directly? like it always has before. This must be different, don't you think? Now that is a very fateful line, isn't it? A realization. The Oracle has been telling characters in this story, you know, Juliana, Frank, uh, Tagomi, others as well, what they ought to be doing, how to interpret the situations that they are finding themselves in This is broader. This is about the entire world and the implications of this book for the world. So um, Carolyn then says, I'll ask it if you won't. And Hawthorne says, it's not your question. He's telling his wife this to ask. Let her ask Juliana. So he says, you have an unnatural mind. Are you aware of that? And um, they talk a little bit about how they do the divination. And then we get to the key question. Now she's going to ask the Oracle two questions. Oracle, why did you write The Grasshopper Lies Heavy? That's the first one. The second one, what are we, human beings, supposed to learn from 
the grasshopper lies heavy from your writing of it, from the why of that. So she throws the coins and she gets the hexagram. What is it? Inner truth. And she says, I know without using the chart and I know what it means. Raising his head, Hawthorne scrutinized her. He had now an almost savage expression. It means, does it, that my book is true? Yes, she said. With anger, he said. Germany and Japan lost the war. Yes. And then Juliana says, even you don't face it. He says, well, I'm not sure of anything. She says, believe. He shook his head, no. Can't you? She said, are you sure? And then he says, well, would you like me to autograph the book? So he's once again misdirecting. He's once again evading, right? But what's going on here? The book is true in the sense that the world that they're living in is not actually the real world. Now, we also got to see this to a certain extent with Mr. Tagomi's experience of a world where Japan and Germany had lost the war as well. There's one other feature that we want to focus on here as the book is ending, The Man in the High Castle. As she's putting her coat on, Hawthorne appeared behind her. Do you know what you are? He turned to Carolyn who stood beside him. This girl is a daimon, a little chthonic spirit that roams tirelessly over the face of the earth. She's doing what's instinctive to her, simply expressing her being. She didn't mean to show up here and do harm. It simply happened to her, just as weather happens to us. I'm glad she came. I'm not sorry to find this out, this revelation that she's had through the book. She didn't know what she was going to do here or find out. I think all of us are lucky, so let's not be angry about it, okay? So he is trying to put aside his own anger. And then Carolyn, his wife, says she's terribly, terribly disruptive. And Hawthorne responds, so is reality, right? They talk a little bit about whether he should take a a hand weapon or not and what she might be doing later on. And then uh, she's she's talking, uh, Carolyn brings this up. Despite what you did for us or what you say you did, you wished I had never come into this house, Juliana said. If you saved Hawthorne's life, it's dreadful of me, but I'm so upset I can't take it all in, what you've said and Hawthorne has said. And here we get to a really interesting observation that will close these reflections. How strange, Juliana said. I never would have thought the truth would make you angry. Truth, she thought, as terrible as death, but harder to find. I'm lucky. I thought you'd be as pleased and excited as I am. A misunderstanding, isn't it? She smiled, and after a pause, Mrs. Abinson managed to smile back. Well, good night anyhow. So we see a a range of reactions to this realization that the world that they're in is not truly the real world, even though it appears real, even though it has its own tissue, its own fabric of realness or reality, there is yet another reality that is more real. And it's not some sort of, you know, um, transcendental thing. It's another world that in which the, the Allies actually won World War II. And that world that's revealed, at least partly through the grasshopper lies heavy, is indeed the real world. The world of the book is more real than the world in which they read the book and think about the book and ask the oracle about the book. And all of this is happening, of course, within the scope of Philip Philip K. Dick's alternate history novel, where we've got these very interesting interplays between different worlds, different histories, different timelines, and the I Ching or Oracle, the Book of Changes, exercising a certain kind of agency leading to Abinson writing this book guided by the divination that the oracle is providing. So what we have here is a revelation, 
and reactions to it on the part of some of the main characters. 